Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, No Contact. It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the Great Galactic Barrier. In the past ten years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out, and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, at an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987, that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now hear this. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Well, Lewis, this is it. I don't suppose you'll be needing the ship's doctor up here on the bridge during blast off. I think not, Smitty. There's little chance of acceleration bends in these new overdrive ships. I'll be in my office then, counting vitamin pills if you need me. It's only a few steps. Good luck, Lewis. Thank you, Smitty. Uh, Lieutenant Collier. Uh, yes, sir? You're relieved. You'd better get down to navigation control and take over. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? We've never flown together before. This is your first flight in a space vessel as big as the Star Cloud. Yes, sir, but I was trained in oversized jobs at the Naval Academy. Well, if you're half as good a navigator as your father was, you'll do fine. Thank you, sir. Did you ship out with my father? I served under him on one of the first rocket runs to the moon. I see. I almost went along on his last trip to the barrier. Um, too bad about that. Yes, sir. That's all, Collier. Paulison. Get me the ground control tower on the field. I want to talk to Colonel Harrison. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. I've patched in the bridge speaker. Colonel Harrison? Yes, Captain. We're standing by for takeoff in 30 seconds. Good. Field's cleared of all personnel. We'll try to reestablish radio contact immediately after takeoff. In any event, there'll be a 24-hour ground monitor. Fine. Good luck. Hope you make it. Thank you. Bridge to navigation control. Have control. Call you. Huh? Ready, Lieutenant? Ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right. Stand by for blastoff. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 20 seconds. 19. 18. 17. 16. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? Paulson, sir. We've uncovered a stowaway. Stowaway? Where? Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room, kill your rockets and stand by. Thorson, this is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's a stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this base. What's the matter with you? Captain, take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, takeoff can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take Don't bother for me for a while. I'm busy. Stupid idiot. Captain Thorson? Yes, come in, Smitty. Here's your story. Now, court martial. The... Oh, Charlie. Can you use a good radio man, Skipper? Well, I see you two have met. I've met. Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Skipper? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They, they turned me down. Well, what's wrong with you? 
Acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, Skipper. I, I got one more good trip in me. Listen, Skipper, you, you, you know that these green kids, they don't know the first thing about space radio operation. Now, you, you put a man like me on and I'll, I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. Charlie, you know the regulations as well as I do. I can't take you much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. Well, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'll have you put aground. I'll tell you what, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact, and it'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. Well, he'd better. I'll have him busted to corporal for letting you sneak aboard. Look, Charlie, you... Look, you'd better be off. Uh, Paulison. Yes, sir? I'm sending this man aground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. I'm... I'm sorry. Good luck, Skipper. <laughs> I thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. If it had been anyone else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, he's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command when we began the regular run to the moon. And if he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Captain Dawson, Nav Control, call you. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, how badly are we fouled up? Can you recalculate the course, or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. If we take off in exactly 30 seconds, we'll need to correct for only a one-degree deflection. I can do that before we breach the stratosphere. That's quick work. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Positive, sir. All right, Collier. I'm putting it in your hands. We'll blast off on your signal. Bridge to engine room. Prepare to blast off on navigator's signal. <laughs> How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. That's four, three, two, zero. We've intersected the course vector. Good work, Collier. Course is corrected, sir. We're ready to go into atomic overdrive any time you say. All right. Stand by. Yes, sir. Now hear this. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Withdraw your dampening rods. Fission chamber ready. Blast tubes cleared. All generators operating at capacity. Take it over, sir. Go into overdrive at the count of zero. Three seconds, Mr. Collier. Three, two, two, two one. One. Zero. Zero. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. My compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit, and he was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Oh, thank you, sir. Start your gyros. Put her on robot control. All right, the bridge is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. Well, Lewis, I see you've got us off the ground. You can thank young Collier for that. Chip off the old block. Uh, you knew his father? Well, as a matter of fact, I knew him very well. First-rate spaceman. Oh, is he the one yes, who... Yes, yes. He was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Volta. Lewis, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Oh, your guess is as good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's a nit? How about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space? That the ships reach it and slip into another dimension? I think that's a lot of rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. Why do you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. And we know that it destroys our ships and crews in some way. There's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it, Lewis? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. The entire hull of this ship is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Now, who are you trying to convince? 
Well, myself, I suppose. Lewis, you've had your share of glory. First skipper to reach the moon back in 1962. You could have retired. Why are you risking this trip? Five ships are missing. Men like Prentice, Margotson, young Collier's father. I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going to Volta? We haven't any choice, Smitty. We're in a race, the kind of race where men and ships are expendable. According to the Interspace Code, the First Nation to reach Volta can claim it. Well, personally, I want no part of it. Oh, Doc. I'll have to play physician, morale builder, and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. And your morale doesn't sound too good, Doc. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction, it is terrible. And something tells me as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Well, I see they haven't court martialed you yet. No, sir. Thanks to you. Well, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. All right. Now, how's our signal? Strong. Clear as a bell. Now, here's our log report for Colonel Harrison. You ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running through. No radiation. Operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. How's the morale, Smitty? The men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. Well, how's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Ah, I was afraid of that. Are they bad? Same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. Eyes are sensitive to infrareds. Eh, I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blues. Well, now there's a theory it's caused by the terrific acceleration of atomic overdrive. The change in gravity affects the circulation. Hmm. What do you think? I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's just an occupational disease of space nerves. Uh-huh. You think it's just uh, nerves, then? Well, young Collier's got a bad case. I, I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not a panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Sir, I understand that you've relieved me from duty. Well, Dr. Smithson says you aren't looking very well, Collier. I'm giving you a rest. Sir, I feel perfectly able to continue. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. Captain, I'd like to remain at my post. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. You think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I I, I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading, Paulison? Uh, we're getting a plus five radar bounce now. Coming off the barrier almost as fast as we sent it out. What's the interval? Two seconds. Shortening steadily. This rate will hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right. Alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Uh, Policy. Yes, sir? The radar bounces up to plus six. We'd better try to make final contact with Earth. Is Spark still trying to raise the base? Uh, yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. Huh? Seems to be some interference. Uh, that's the radio room now. Yes? You got him? Well, cut in on the bridge speaker. The captain will take it from here. Hello? Star Cloud to Earth. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. 
We're getting heavy static from Sunspot. That's not Sunspots, Charlie. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Getting a plus... No, a plus seven radar bounce. Expect to hit the barrier almost any second now. Good luck, Skipper. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece, I'll try to get back to you on the high-frequency band. Got you, Skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, Star Cloud. Must be getting awfully close now, Captain. It was bouncing back so fast it's almost beating the signal. When they go inside, hold on to your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain. (laughs) Nothing happened. We, We made it. We made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. Now, the, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They've earned it. Doc, can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can, Lord. This calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? It couldn't be better. How's yours? It couldn't be better. The... Condition red. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation, Radiation detected. Red. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation detected. Holy mackerel. Look at the needle on that indicator. Paulison. Paulison. Yes, I see it, Captain. Picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? Well, it's a strong impulse. What kind? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray, too short for UHF. Whatever it is, sir, the ship is lousy. We'll track it down, triangulate it, and make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is the fission chambers? No leak here, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? We'll keep at it. Paulison, how are you doing? Uh, I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? Well, I'll have to recheck my figures. I'll hurry it up. Angle is correct, but I... Now, come I on, don't... man, for Pete's sake. Where's the radiation coming from? Sir, it's... It's coming from inside the ship. Well, that's impossible. No, sir, I've checked it twice. Well, it's got to be the engines, then. If it is, sir, we're finished. Engine room. Yes, sir. That radiation must be in the overdrive pile. No, sir, it isn't here, sir. Are you certain? Yes, sir. All right, keep checking. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing this ship inch by inch. Yes, sir. All right, turn it on. Yes, sir. All right. Ready, Captain. We'll check the atomic guns first. Come on. We'll uh, cut through the officer's quarters here to ordinance. Now, turn here. Oh, well, wait a minute, sir. Huh? What is it? The signal's weaker now. Yeah. Let's go back. Hold it. Hold it. Seems strongest right about here. Well, it doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is this? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier? Oh, he's down in that control, sir. Oh, I'll try the door. Well, it's not locked, sir. Oh, it's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked, I'll sir. Oh, smash it. Oh, shut off that Geiger counter. Now, what do you make of this, Paulison? Oh, it looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufactured. I, I, I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Paulison. Get down to nav control and bring Collier up to the bridge on the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? Uh, I know a way. <laughs> Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with a transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? Oh, you know nothing about it. No, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir, unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? I suppose so, if someone had a key. I found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I meant a key to the wall cabinet. I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, I... uh... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? Well, I just assumed, sir. Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie. Having known and respected your father. Having observed the way you handle your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Paulison, turn on that Geiger counter. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. 
That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter, how do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? Well, I... I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom were you sending those signals? Condition red! Condition red! There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approach. Alien spaceship approach. Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk! Very well, Captain. My mission seems completed. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. Oh, what? The government of the planet of Voltan. You're crazy. Are you so stupid, Captain? Did you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information? Your language, your culture, family background. Uh, your appearance, you, you, you look like... Like Commander Collier? Well, is that so surprising, Captain? You see, Captain, we had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish, Captain. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship now coming in water frame. I'll deal with you later, Collier Paulison. Yes, sir. Put this man in irons. Take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Carpenter, Robinson. <laughs> Gunnery. Gunnery Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters. They're closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on the bearing. Fire. Fire, Richardson. Richardson, did you hear me? Fire! What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no what? use to shout, Captain. Collier, how did you get loose? Where's Paulison? Lieutenant Paulison is dead. All stations! Lieutenant Collier has escaped! Seize him, men! Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. You're lying! No, Captain. Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. No? Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Robinson, Haley, report. You see, Captain? Captain. Carpenter! Robinson! Haley! It's quite useless, Captain. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. Very well, Collier. You beat us. What now? The ship will be taken to Volta for, shall we say, further experimentation. I see. Of course, there's one thing you hadn't counted on. Just what is that, Captain? Listen! Carpenter! Are you in there, Lieutenant Carpenter? They can't all be dead. There must be one alive. Smitty! Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty! What have they done to him? Lower side. Oh, dirty. I, uh, I, I don't talk. I must lean, lean closer. It's not much time. Lewis, space blues. Space blues? What is it, Smitty? What are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues. Voltans. Yeah, hello, let me help you. Oh, no, Lewis, get message back to Earth. Voltan, fifth column. Watch out for it. Smitty. Oh, Smitty. Captain Thorson. Captain Thorson, Captain Thorson you, can't you can't hide from us from now. Come, come back, back to the bridge and surrender. surrender. Or my, my men will, will come, come and, and get, get you. you. Hello. Hello. Star Cloud calling Earth. Oh, please, God, let me get through. It's too late. Hello. Star Cloud to Earth. 
Come in, please. Come in, please. Hello. Hello. Stark out to Earth. Captain Thorson calling. Charlie, come in, please. Hurry. Hello. Oh, hello. Can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. Oh, my God. Now, look, Charlie, listen to me. Not much time. Get word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Fultons. What? Fultons. Spell that. V-O-L. Fultons. That's right. They're from the planet Volta. Skipper. Skipper, are you all right? Now, Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now, listen. They have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You mean it? Of course I mean it. Tell Harrison, posing as humans. You can detect them by space blues. You got that only Fultons get space blue. Charlie, did you hear me? Space blue. I get you. They're breaking in, Charlie. I'm defending you. Warn everybody. Captain. They, they opened the door. So long, Charlie. Tell her. Ah! Captain. Ah, ah, ah. Captain Thorson. Hello. Hello, Star Cloud. What's the trouble, Sergeant? I was just trying to raise a Star Cloud, Colonel. I had any luck? No, sir. No contact. No contact, eh? No, sir. Mm, nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get a message back. No, sir. Neither do I. Oh, all right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, you you do that, sir. It's all yours. Right. Oh, and Charlie, uh, you better go out and get yourself some coffee. You look a little blue around the gills. Tonight... X-1 has brought you No Contact, written by George Lefferts from an original story of Lefferts and Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Captain, Donald Buca as Collier, Wendell Holmes as Charlie, and Bill Griffiths, Bill Smith, Matt Crowley, and Ken Williams. Your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for a blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X Minus One. If you wanted to take over our world with a minimum amount of resistance and trouble, how would you go about it? Tonight we'll tell you how, with a strange and chilling story by George Lefferts, The Parade. You are Mr. Sid Ryan. The same. My name is Lucha. I am a Martian. Ah, pleased to meet you, Mr. Lu... Uh, what was that again? A Martian. As in Orson Welles? Precisely. <laughs> I'm a Rotarian myself. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Lucha, what can Publicity Associates do for you? I am interested in obtaining publicity. It has been my observation that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lucha. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client... The client, of course, will be the Martians. You don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Lucha. Oh, how do you Mr. Do... Lucha claims to be a Martian. Take him outside, will you, Oliver? I am happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I guessed it would. I believe we can do business. I have here cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand... Oliver... 
Take a look at that wad of lettuce. It's the real stuff, Mr. Ryan. And my client is prepared to spend many times that amount. Oh, sit down, Mr. Lucha. Oliver, get the client a cigar, the 50-cent box. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign. A very large and important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Something quite new. Now... What would you judge the most effective type of campaign? Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying, Watch this space. Then about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Then finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. Excellent. We will conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire and the whole campaign is kafloppo. Quite so, quite so. The utmost secrecy. Ah, uh, you realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would, say, one million dollars cover expense? Hey, come again? I said, would one million dollars cover it? Why, well, yes, I am at... You did say, uh, a million. I understood that you have handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... No, no, not at all, not at all, I... As a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, oh, oh of course. That's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right. Mm. Yes, sir. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, the streetcars with a very simple statement. Uh, what's that? I will write it on a card. Here you are. The... Martians are coming. Say, that's not a bad teaser. Got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. The next ad will read, June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. Uh, what happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the Macy Parade? Exactly. Except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow. The Martian world. My client would like it to be a gay affair. Balloons, clowns, pennants... Pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Luchard, just uh, what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? Oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy, remember? Yeah, but after all... Mr. I... Ryan, all will be revealed to you in good time. For the moment... Let us say that we are selling a concept. A concept? The concept of... Invasion from Mars. Sorrow Talent Agency. Uh, Sammy Sorrow, please. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Sammy, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine, I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40, June 1st. And listen, Sammy, I want them dressed in little space suits. In little... Uh, you, you know, like men from Mars. Mars. Okay? And I want some movie extras, uh, maybe 50 of them. 50. Also 50. rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome. Got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with pretty girls on top of them. Uh -huh. Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the one we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. Yeah, I'll try, Sid. Never mind the expense. Just get me the talent. Sounds like you landed a big client there. Who is it? <laughs> it's a secret. I got to hang now. Call me back, Sammy. Right. Uh, how you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan. Just fine. I got a hundred small boys pasting little stickers. The Martians are coming on the subway platform. Good. We got full-page ads in all the dailies. Good. And ten-second spot announcements on every local station. Good. It's costing a fortune. Good. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you were going to the electric chair, Oliver. Yes, sir. How are you making out in the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Bonham invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbals, and Sacks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them and funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. Well, that sounds fine, only... Uh... Only what? Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. Oliver, my boy. Do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not putting two and two together? You mean... You know who Luchar represents? Just by accident, understand. I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. One of those expensive pictures they make in secret and then spring on the public because they don't want the other studios to get the jump on them. What's the picture? 
a space opera titled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh. Oh, I begin to see. Also, by mere coincidence, it's supposed to have its premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? Yes, but... uh... Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Features Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no, so they have to get around the contract. A man named Lucha, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. (laughs) Need I go further? I don't know, Mr. Ryan. Sounds pretty far-fetched to me, but I don't know. That's what I like about you, Oliver. You're so innocent. Now, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello. Commish, Sid Ryan. Oh. How are you, Ryan? Fine. What is it this time? You want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water? The answer is no. (laughs) Also, we're not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade. June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Now, look, Ryan, Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the Warren of the Green. Oh, don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. I have the 5th Avenue Merchants Association behind me. (sighs) Okay. Fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. By the way, what's the occasion for this parade? Oh, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. How is the campaign going, Mr. Ryan? Like wildfire, Mr. Lucha, like wildfire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I got some of the merchants doing World of Tomorrow displays in their windows. Every big novelty manufacturer in town is climbing on the bandwagon. They want to get into the parade with floats, giveaways, anything. Everybody smells a buck to be made. I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor himself declared Martian Day. I've even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the policeman's benevolent fund from the man from Mars. Oh, it's terrific, terrific. My blood pressure's up to 200. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, uh, I understand Century Pictures spent over a million bucks making that space opera. I beg pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucha. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? <laughs> Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Daly speaking to you from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York, a perfect day for a parade, and the streets are packed with thousands of spectators all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of shrill expectancy. Some of the kids and their parents have been camped on the curbstone since early this morning to be sure of ringside seats when the so-called Martians pass by. I've, uh, I've just had word from Saul Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, now while we're waiting for the arrival of the parade... We brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this most spectacular of all publicity stunts. Uh, that's right. Come on. Uh, what's your name, madam? Uh, Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. Uh huh. And where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Columbus, Ohio. I see. And I, I see you have your family with you too. Uh, two little curly-headed blonde boys. Uh, are you in New York on vacation? We came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Uh, well, uh, what do you think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here two hours. I, I can't make head or tail of it. Well, uh, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley. But judging by the thousands here today, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, folks say. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. Mr. Ryan's uh, yeah, here. Well, yeah. Uh, Ryan, Ryan. Right. right. And uh, this is Mr. Sid Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity man who's the brains behind the Martian Day stunt. 
Hello, Sid. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, easy, easy. Not so close to the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Sid, you've certainly lifted the lid this time. Looks like it, doesn't it? Sid, there's been a great deal of speculation as to exactly what all this is leading up to. I've heard some folks say it's a big war bond drive. Uh, others think it's just to stimulate local business. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand in the trade itself, the smart, smart money says you're building for the premiere of Century's forthcoming extravaganza, Invasion from Mars. Now, come clean. Can you tell us what the real story is? Ah, uh, I can. I'd like to, but honestly, I can't. Oh, man of mystery, eh? Are you going to watch the parade from the stand here? No, I can't. I can't stand noise. I'm going out to my office and watching comfort. <laughs> well, thank you, Sid Ryan. And good luck. And here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade. Swinging down Fifth Avenue with fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the trappings of a Mardi Gras. And here in the vanguard is a whole, a whole troop of little midgets in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits carrying Rube Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. Let's see, I, I can read one which says... Atomic Blaster. <laughs> Another one has a placard reading, we're, uh, we're Martian through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns, laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of the great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. This is promised as the climax of the show. Now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. And now here they come, ladies and gentlemen, the Martians, marching in booted, helmeted ranks, row after row of them. Why, this is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen, and a rather serious contrast to the rest of the joyous slapstick parade we've witnessed. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each is holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position. They're marching in absolute silence, keeping step perfectly, as though some mute, unspoken command were marking time for them. The, the crowd seems rather grim and serious now. Perhaps they're reminded of the actuality of war and possible invasion. They stand solemnly, silently, watching. Even the children are awed. And now the first ranks of the Martians are moving past us, down Fifth Avenue toward the reviewing stands at the square. No one moves. What's that? What's happening? Oh, there are a woman, a woman, ladies and gentlemen. She dashed out into the street. For what reason, I don't know. She attempted to lift the visor of one of the Martian spacesuits, but just as she reached the Martian, she fell forward in a dead faint. I tell you, I've never felt such mass tension in a crowd as we're experiencing here right now, today. All sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the audience. There are excited whispers of she's dead, she fainted, and now an undercurrent of... What? They're really Martians. This is an example of how a single incident can precipitate mass hysteria, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's a mighty reassuring sight to see the blue uniforms of New York's finest spaced every ten feet or so along the avenue. Somehow, I, I can't explain it, this incident has begun to work on what was a moment ago a happy, carefree crowd. And the complexion is changing. Did you see that? A woman fainted. Of course I saw it. 
What do you suppose she saw? Oliver, old man, did I ever tell you you were too naive for this business? But that young woman ran out into the streets to get a close look at the Martians, and then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver, the stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. Yeah, for my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Uh, shut the window. Don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucha? I haven't seen him. Well, he'll be around. Boy, those Martians sure look like the real thing. How would you know the real thing if you saw it, Oliver? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. Uh, close the window, Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan. Talent Agency. Sammy, this is Sid Ryan. Say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. Oh, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Well, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in the bag? Never felt better. You mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, but Sid, under the circumstances... Sid. Well, what is it? Sid, don't you know? I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. I was going to call you, but I figured... Hey, wait a minute. Where these guys come from if you didn't hire them? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe Oliver... Oh, hold on. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? No, sir, I... Sammy, this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... Okay, ca- Sammy, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. I just don't know. I've got to locate Lucha. What's Century Pictures number? Mr. Ryan, this is Sunday. Oh, yeah. Well, get me their publicity director, Marty Sanford, at home. Oh, yes, Thanks. Sanford. Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the uh, Fine, fine. Uh, listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucha. Uh, Lou who? Lucha, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. I- invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you, Batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. Too expensive and too fantastic. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. And I never heard of a guy named Luke. Mother of heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. Well, that's too fantastic. What's too fantastic, Mr. Ryan? Is something wrong? Open that window. I want another look at those Martians. Yes, sir. Look at them. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that and say... 24 hours? Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one other step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi storm troops marching through the streets of Paris. See those chests on them? That's pride. Sheer, arrogant pride. Look at those chins. That's contempt. Nobody could act like that. Mr. Ryan! Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who fainted. Her name's Gloria Montex. Get her up here. Make it fast. (laughs) Here she is, Mr. Ryan. I... I can't get much sense, however. Stay away from me. Gloria, it's me, Sid Ryan. Oh, don't kid me. You're a Martian. Gloria, settle down. No, you're wearing a mask. Baby, it's me, Sid. And underneath, it's, it's awful. It's all big green eyes and those, those feelers like, like a catfish. Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you, but the fainting, that wasn't in the act. Oh, go away, please. Go away. What'd you see? Oh, no, please. It's too awful. Please, please. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what'd you see? You won't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver, I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. we got to stop this parade before things begin to happen. Okay, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. you got to stop that parade. I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front-page spread on every paper in town. Honest, you publicity guys give me a pay. This may be a matter of life and death. Oh, sure, sure. 
Look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where these Martians came from, who they are, or anything about them. All I want you to do is stop the parade and make sure they're on the level. Uh Uh-uh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. If you let the sergeant show you out... You won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection and you refuse it. I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than a fried egg. Go ahead. I'm sure his honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. You heard me, Ryan. You cannot see the mayor. Adolf, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guys, something horrible is already happening. A couple hundred little kids are in the hospital with ptomaine poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. Or didn't you know? I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure, sure, you'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people would get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space that would get you and your product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. You won't have to, because you're going to get out of here right now. Go on, beat it, get out. You and your publicity stunts make me sick to my stomach. Oliver, where are you? Uh, Oliver. Oliver! It is useless what? to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucha. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him, you stinking murderer. Now, now Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled, now would it? Lucha, start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? But surely you know, Mr. Ryan, after all, you've been publicizing it for months. Listen, you... Please do not interrupt. You see, before colonizing your planet, we Martians sent advanced scouts to study your habits, your weaknesses... We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity. And so, we conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. Clever, huh? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plans? Holy jumping catfish. You've done very well. Then... There was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is death. What are you trying to do, Lucha? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundreds would suffice. In exactly two minutes, our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucha, but not if I can help it. You... Yes, please? Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry. Reviewing stand, Sergeant Cassidy. Get me Commissioner Patrick. Hello. 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 You'll have to talk loud. I want Commissioner Patrick. Oh. Patrick, Patrick! Wait, wait a minute. Th- things are quieting down. Uh, now, what was it you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. What? Stop him! Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. You I... idiot! The worst is going on! the operator. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan, you've been cut off. I can't seem to get them back. Doesn't matter, operator. Nothing matters now. X-1 has brought you The Parade, an original story written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Joe DeSantis as Luchar, Alexander Scorby as Daly, Agnes Young as The Woman, Ellen Deming as Gloria, John Thomas as Oliver, 
Arthur Anderson as Sammy, Wendell Holmes as the commissioner, and William Keene as Sanford. Your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life, intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine? Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now hear this, now hear this, approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits, stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. As she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. 4. 350. 3. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. the power. Masters, pipe battle stations. I sir. All secured, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars, April 20th, 1987, 433 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, masters. I sir. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. 
The first First man man shipped from from Earth Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what what dangers dangers we may face. face. We're 17 17 men on an alien world. world. And it's up to us us whether we ever get home again. again. The next Next few few hours should tell tell the story. story. And I want want instant instant obedience to all commands. commands. I'll I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. Inspection, Captain. Now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now I hear this landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst. Report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Come on. Let's get in the lock. Hinkson, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I are for your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you... Uh, find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way up? After all, we are invaders. Now hear this. Landing time minus two. All right, all right. We heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Lustig? Uh, only Chicago. Well, you ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Oh, tough. No, oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. I right. right, sir. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not rewarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters. Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Aye, sir. It's fresh air. Let's go. Now, take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground, Mr. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the... Quiet! Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. 
don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Hingston. Hi, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Hi, sir. What do you make of the ground, horse? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there with the mists thinned out. What the... Hingston, hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain. What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, horse. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that, that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars... Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. It can't be, sir. Horst... Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that port swing of the piano and, and beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like the town I was born in. Well, it, it looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe, maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Oh, how else can you explain it? Uh, suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Been space travel, it couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. I see. All right, come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What... What town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand? Mars. You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars. Isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I told you I'd call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Of course, is it possible that we got fouled up, made, made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone, gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, this won't hold water. It's, it's not logical. We've, we, we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Lustig out at point. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. Aye, sir. Horst, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain! What? That, that, that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought of... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! Lustig, come back here! He's running for that house. That crazy fool after him, quick! Lustig, stop! Come down off of that porch! Never! 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 Lustig, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! <sighs> Grandma, Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig! Oh, Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfolks. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. 
How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. Do you mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandfather. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now, let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. First, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration? They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You! You, masters! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not a bad guy for an officer. Uh, uh, what's it? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hey, I'll be right back, Captain Uncle George. Uncle what George. the devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're, they're all here. You're right, Captain. I've found it. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Given it orders. You don't understand, Captain. I understand mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. John! Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun. It's you. Edward. Yes. It can't be. Oh, of course it is. Johnny, Johnny, Ed, you old... <laughs> Ed, what? Dr. Horst, this is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to, to see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've, I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? <laughs> How's that, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed? Ed! <laughs> we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst, Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> By George, 35 years. So don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? <laughs> What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will, when does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. Well, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. 
I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Horst. Well, oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Well, I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there. She must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I... Don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any, Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you have to stay over. Yes, well, but... that uh... settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but, Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the daybed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. <laughs> yes, I... I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship... You know, Ed, security check. What, why do you have to do that here? I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, huh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians. All the time there was only Mom and Dad and... and Edward waiting. Now, it's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose... There were Martians, mm -hmm. and they saw us land. And suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? Oh, I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, mm -hmm. suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images stolen from our own memories by Martians, created for us by telepathy. Hypnotist. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory. No real loved person. Not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to... recreate. How about that phone call? Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, sick, delirious... I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care well, of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her. By reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? A whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house. Sleeping. Trust me. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother? His grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But... We've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen, the crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ahead. We, uh, we wanted a drink of water. That's, that's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a His drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marsh! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John. This way, horse! Horse, where are you? Ah! Hello! 
Hello. Can you hear me, Earth? This this is Captain John Black, the XR-53 calling for Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now. The Martians! I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hinkston, Lustig, Dr. Horst. Poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen! Listen! They're trying to break through the hull. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks. But, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? Martians, not men. They, they make you think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth! Hello, Earth! Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Wayne as a transcribed NBC Radio Network production.